Howard Limbert's team is a third of a mile into Mountain River Cave. They have food for six days, enough to get to the Great Wall of Vietnam and back. The team sets up camp. Rehydrating and replacing lost calories has to be carefully managed. Geomorphologist Dr. Hugh Muen and biologist Dr. Tai Muen of Hanoi University also join Limbert on the expedition. Hopefully the other porters will take all the other bags to our underground camp. <laughs> this is a great trip. It's an amazing group. And everybody has pulled more than their weight. Annette Betcher goes deeper and further into the cave, looking for life. And like Granger, she's getting frustrated in her search. She is here to find undiscovered species, but so far only sees a barren landscape. It's a bit of a shame. I had great expectations, but with the wet flooding, I um, had to rethink, basically, my approach. The team is exhausted and settles down for their first night inside the cave. The next morning, they continue over half a mile further. Daryl Granger has explored some of the largest caves in the world. But this one is about to reveal something he's never seen before. Deep in the heart of Mountain River Cave lie the magical and mysterious domains. <laughs> wow. Here, the cave roof has collapsed inwards, allowing sunlight to flood in, connecting above and below ground with the vital ingredients of life, water and light. Man. This is the world's biggest cave. The rest of this stuff is just, is just building up to it. That is amazing. That's one and a half kilometers away. That is huge. <laughs> but that looks like you know it's 100 meters away, like we're in a, a normal sized cave. That's a kilometer and a half. It, it's just it's hard to even imagine how big that passage is. Here, a unique mini jungle has taken root, a quarter of a mile below the surface of the earth. Seeing the jungle basically in the middle of the caves is one of the most beautiful sights. Uh, it's just absolutely incredible. It's got to be one of the wonders of the world. It doesn't happen anywhere else on this planet. I think that's just about the holy grail for a biologist. For Granger, the Dolene is an unexpected window into the structure of the limestone here. It's also a view of Mountain River Cave's Achilles heel. This is a, a good example of a special type of doline. This is a collapsed doline. So that happens when you have a cave passage and then the surface collapses into that cave. And it happened here because we have really thin beds. Uh, you can sort of see them on the back side of the wall. And they're just not strong enough to hold up this cave roof. At some point in the cave's past, the river ate away at the cave roof where the limestone beds are thinner. The river damaged the ceiling rock so much that eventually the roof collapsed. This collapse is known as cantilever failure. You can think about, uh, theoretically at least, having a, a piece of rock sticking out like a diving board. You can only stick it out so far before it breaks off under its own weight. And that's exactly what happens. As you make the cave bigger and bigger, you're forcing basically a diving board of rock, a slab of rock to stick out and support its own weight. The limestone beds in this part of Vietnam are especially thick with very few cracks or weak points. The river tunnels through this landscape, challenging the strength of pure limestone. And the dolines brutally reveal the few places where the rock beds are thinner, weaker, but still divine. 
here, open to the sun and the rain, life thrives. Dr. Tai Muen and Annette Betcher are the first to climb into the undergrowth. She's eager to tap into Muen's expertise in rainforest plant species to figure out how this subterranean wonderland compares with the surface. After disappointments in the first part of the cave, the Dolene fulfills Betcher's expectations. Here is an area rich with life, a unique and unexplored ecosystem. This is absolutely fantastic. It's a treasure trove for biologists. And everything that lives here has got here by complete chance. So birds have dropped seeds, plants have sprouted up. And this species outside is evergreen. Okay. Just, right. But here it's fallen down the leaf in the winter, I think so. Okay, so you think and it's evergreen outside, but it's deciduous in here. Yeah. And so the, the young leaves are those, the, the red leaves? Are yeah. those young leaves? Okay, right. Betcher had hoped to find new species of plants evolved to flourish in this strange underground world. But Muen doesn't see examples of unique evolution. Instead, he thinks the plants in the Dolene are showing extreme adaptation. It's a process known to biologists as phenotypic plasticity. In particular in plants, um, their, their outer form is very variable. They can adapt themselves very much to their environment. So there could be two plants that are perfectly the same species, have the same DNA, but because they're in a different environment, they actually look quite different. That's the plasticity bit. So we're, I think we're seeing an example of spectacular phenotypic plasticity. Unique adaptations appear throughout the Dolene. In the tropics, trees are usually evergreen due to the absence of seasons. But down here, they're deciduous, with sparse foliage and narrow trunks. Dr. Muen theorizes that this is how the trees adapt to the comparative lack of water, shortage of light. These steep doline walls enclose this mini jungle and act as a natural barrier to the outside world, trapping pockets of life deep within the cave. Betcher looks for soil thick enough to lay some surface traps. Alcohol will preserve any creatures that venture in. Now she must try to find any signs of life in the dark cave. But so far, the chance of finding anything of significance doesn't look good. Could the acidic water that created this cave also be destroying all life within? In the wet, active part of Mountain River Cave, Daryl Granger discovers a clue as to why the apparently very ordinary water here has carved out such an extraordinary cave. He's got a hunch that the speed of the water at peak flood could be the key factor. Here, what we see are little scallops that are carved in the wall. They're dissolved in the wall by water as it passes by. He expects to find evidence that the water runs through here at a great speed. The faster the water goes by, the smaller the scallops. So if we see big, giant scallops, they can be you know, up to a meter across. That's very, very slow moving water. Here, you know, they're about the size, they're, they're about an inch across, a couple of centimeters across. From the size of the scallops, Granger can also figure out what's known as the Reynolds number, a crucial measurement that tells him how turbulent the water is. Like the acidity test earlier, the findings here are very average and offer no clues as to why this cave grew so big. He calculates that the water here travels at only three miles per hour, a totally ordinary velocity for any river. Although Granger's drawn a blank on his quest, he might still be able to help Betcher on hers. He considers the chronology of the cave's life. I think what happened is the first doline collapsed and it's acting like a big dam okay. right in the cave. Right. We pass that doline and suddenly everything dries out. We yeah. don't see the same. It becomes more normal. 
yeah. becomes more yeah. of a normal, okay. less active cave. And that's where the wildlife comes in, because right. if it doesn't get flooded out every 10 years or so, it can actually it has time to evolve. For Granger, the formula for how Mountain River Cave grew so big remains a mystery. This area has the right ingredients for a big cave. Unusually large beds of pure limestone and heavy monsoon rains feeding a deep river. But the water's speed and turbulence doesn't reveal anything. And Granger is almost at a loss. Oi! The surveying team looks for answers too. Oi! That's probably a 500 meter e echo. So if we ever push in a cave and you get to end of a cave or end of the exploration for a day, we often give it a big oi just to see if it's still continuing. And we know we can turn around and come back to a, another successful push the next day. A bit further, Jonathan. For this expedition, they need to use a more sophisticated way of measuring the cave's size. Cave surveying used to be a primitive process where everything was done by hand. Now, digital laser readings cut out the tedious legwork and provide precise measurements. They must survey every part of the cave precisely, and every measurement must be exact to the nearest inch. When it comes to claiming the title world's biggest cave, it's length, width, and height that count for Howard Limbert and his team. The laser sends a beam across to a designated point called a survey station which sims marks with a small light disc. They measure distance, height, and angle. It's painstaking work. 29.9, minus three, yeah. zero, nine, nine. Yeah. Left sight. Yeah. The laser beam picks out the highest point in this section of the cave. It measures 328 feet high. The Statue of Liberty could fit in here quite comfortably with room to grow. The widest section surveyed so far is 338 feet across. This passage continues for another half mile. Enough room for a small plane to fly through, or even a whole display team. Very good. So if right. we go back to the original Main station, passage. and then we'll get some legs straight down there. OK. Can you shine your target? Shine on Limbert your target. believes this target. cave is consistently longer and wider than Deer Cave, but he needs to find the highest area. Just up a bit, Jonathan. Light on. They're now over two and a half miles in, and Deer Cave still holds the title of the world's biggest cave. Hope lies beyond the wall, but they have just three days left to survey, and there's a problem mounting. While the Dolines bring in light, they also allow weather from above to seep down into the cave. Jonathan, come a bit closer. Please. please, we've got a problem with the clouds now. It's extremely accurate if there's no cloud in the way, which there is in this case across the far side. So this is one thing that does make it difficult, one of the peculiar hazards of surveying in a cave this size. The poor visibility means the team must stop the survey. It's a paralyzing setback. They're running out of time to get to the end of the cave. Time is running out to survey Mountain River Cave. Howard Limbert makes a tough decision. He sends his two best climbers, Sweeney and Clark, ahead to set the rigging on the treacherous Great Wall of Vietnam so the rest of the expedition can follow tomorrow. If they can't scale it, they may not finish the survey and we'll never know just how big this cave really is. In 2009, the explorers estimated the forbidding wall to be nearly 50 feet tall. Now, Clark and Sweeney think it's much bigger, estimating 200 feet, nearly the height of a 20-story building. They have the gear for the challenge, but the wall is going to be a longer, more dangerous climb than they expected. Geologists call this a flowstone, rock made weak and fragile by water dripping from the ceiling. The first 15 foot is this, which looks very good, but if you... If that's what it is. 